who the sun sets free is free indeed. Worship with us as we sing who you say I am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, it's free in me, I'm a child of God, yes, I am. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yeah. Who the sun's free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a strong of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Chosen, I'm for I am who you say I am. You are for me, not a I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. In the sun's sun, I was free. our confidence. We are a child of the King, a child of our true God. The songs we've chosen this morning have a lot to do with the condition of our heart. Yield my heart to you, O Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
Revolution. Morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. Well, probably won't surprise a lot of you that I do a lot of wondering. <laughs> I also do a lot of wandering, but that's a totally different thing. <laughs> and one of the things that I wonder is why on earth? is a Bible, 1,939 pages. Most Bibles that I've looked at, they've 2,000 pages, close to that. Makes me think of uh, in the 70s, there was an organization or a man, I'm not sure which, that came up with an overview that was called the Four Spiritual Laws. And um, you could probably fit it on something like this.
problem with that is, if you look at one of them, I believe it's something like God loves us. There's a lot of stuff that's in there. <laughs> when I look, when I read the Bible, I come up with a complex picture of the people that are in it. I mean, I know somebody like a Jonah. I know somebody like a Peter. These are complex people. And our God is complex. I'd like to read Psalm 19, which fleshes things out just a little bit more. But for the rest of the story, you got to read about 2,000 pages. <laughs> the first part of this psalm points out that God exists, He's extremely creative and very powerful. And this evidence is everywhere. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The next part of this psalm tells us a little bit about what God's like. But like I mentioned before, for the rest of the story, you got to read about 2,000 pages. <laughs> the law of the Lord is perfect. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more pre precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them, is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. And the last part is, how should we respond, or how did the psalmist respond? Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sin. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. For, oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I invite you to pray with me. Father, I thank you that you've put stars in the sky, millions and trillions of them, Your creativity is all around us, the myriad of animals, the myriad of plants. And I thank you that you 
have created us all different, all precious. And I ask, Father, for your help in glorifying you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Melissa is going to come up with a story for the children. Before I do that, <clears throat> October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I just want to take a moment to thank Nelson for the work that he does for the church. It certainly has been an unusual year, and I know his schedules have been changed. Even Sunday mornings are different than he, what he was accustomed to, and, uh, but I think he's done a, a tremendous job supporting us and encouraging us and I know praying for us. So I also want to thank June, as the saying goes, behind every great man is a wonderful woman. So I want to thank both of them for their work at the church. And God bless you as you continue to do his work. We have a, we have a card here and a gift for you. I'm going to do a little, something a little different this morning. I have an object lesson. I don't think there's any children present, although some of you are acting like children this morning, Roland and Nick. <clears throat> Once there was a gardener who planted in his garden seeds. Each day the gardener cared for the seeds. He watered them, pulled weeds, from around them and sheltered them from the heat and the sun. The seeds grew into seedlings, which developed into plants, until one day they produced fruit. Can anybody tell me what kind of fruit? Pumpkin. Pumpkins. This pleased the gardener. He looked out of his garden and said, it is good. One, the, one day the gardener went out into his field and picked a special pumpkin. This is the special pumpkin. It was a little bit dirty from laying in the garden, so he brought it inside and gently wiped it off. Now the pumpkin looked as clean, it looked clean on the outside. But what about the inside? He took a knife, cut open the top of the pumpkin, and what did he find? Ugh, a bunch of slimy, yucky goo. <laughs> so he scraped it out, cleaned it all out, Got all the goo out. He smelled like a pumpkin for a day. Got it all nice and clean. So it was clean on the inside as it was on the outside. But the gardener still wasn't satisfied with the pumpkin. He decided it needed a face. So he carefully cut out two eyes nose and a smiling mouth. Uh-oh. <laughs> There's an eye. There's the nose. <laughs> now the gardener's special pumpkin looked clean and happy. 
but the gardener still wasn't satisfied with the pumpkin. So he put a light in it. The pumpkin glowed so beautifully. The gardener's special project was complete. When friends and neighbors saw the gardener's special pumpkin, they marveled at how he took something ordinary from his garden, cleaned it inside and out, put his light inside, and made it something extraordinary. We are like pumpkins and God is the gardener. God creates us and cares for us. He chooses us from all the other pumpkins, but inside we all have the yucky goo, sin. Just like the gardener cleaned out his pumpkin's goo, God wants to clean out all our sin too. So he sent his son, Jesus, to die for our sins, to take the punishment we deserved. Just like the gardener gave the pumpkin a new face, God makes us a new creation. Just like the gardener put his light into the pumpkin to make it shine, so God gives us his light to shine through us. So when we let God clean out our sin by believing that Jesus died to pay the punishment that we deserve, he turns us into, a new, cre he turns us into new creations that can shine for him. And when others see our light, then they might want to learn how to have a light of their own. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Now, if we could have the, if the ushers can bring up the offering. And I have the privilege of giving the offertory prayer. <laughs> Father, we thank you for all of your blessings. Thank you for family, for friends, for this church. Thank you, Father, for the money that you give us, resources that you give us. Join with us as we continue to worship our Heavenly Father, our, our way maker, as we sing, as we sing that song, God makes a way. He is our way maker. You are here in 
filling every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. My God, that is who you are. They make a miracle work a promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 just drops before our eyes as we sing words that we've sung and we've sung and we've sung. And just as we sang that song this morning, the reality hit me. God is that promise keeper. He keeps his promises. I see 
signs on people's lawns about Trump keeping his promises. But more than that, God keeps his promises. His word is truth. And those promises, those 2,000 pages hold true over all these decades, over all these centuries. We need him. Our hearts need him. Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, now I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Thank the worship team and everyone for the music. Um, 
Today's reading is from Acts, and uh, I always like to put a little bit of context. Um, in our previous, we're, this is part of a series, in the previous, Nelson might disagree with me, but go for it. <laughs> I would kind of summarize it as God cares about our spiritual needs, our physical needs, and our emotional needs, and as a community, we should care about our communities, spiritual needs, physical needs, and emotional needs. That's my summary, but hopefully it's not too far off. This is further along. The, the, the other readings were in the beginning of the book of Acts, and this, this is further along. So one way of summarizing the book of Acts, we spent a lot of time in Sunday school going over the book of Acts, is that uh, in the beginning, the, we had the apostles witness to Jerusalem, then to Judea and Sam, um, Samaria. Then Paul took a trip, and after that trip, this is where this fits in. And then he took another trip, <laughs> actually several trips. This is in Acts 15, 1 through 6. And it begins, certain individuals came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told the Gentiles, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The, elders, the apostles and elders meant to consider this question. You could bow with me in prayer. I'd like to bless the rest of the service in Nelson's sermon. Father, I ask for a special blessing upon Nelson as he gives us the word for the day, your word for the day. I thank you for I thank you, Father, for Nelson's work in this church and for the influence he's been on me. And I ask for your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It seems to me that it's only appropriate that much of what we've talked about during this four-part sermon series on God's faithful community comes from. Oh, it disappeared. Sorry about that. As we're looking at the faithful community of God's people, we've been looking at the book of Acts pretty much every week. As so I stop and think about why that is, well, obviously, it's the beginning of the church. Remember, we talked about Pentecost being the birth of the church. The book of Acts covers, does anybody know this, how many years it covers in the life of the church? I didn't know this until I looked it up. It covers 30 years. So maybe helpful to think how old you are and back 30 years, what, what's happened in the last 30 years whether it's in church or whether it's at home in your family or in your community, a lot of stuff 
happens in 30 years. And so think about this in terms of the life of the church. Okay, you go from having no church to having church and then developing that church. And so that's the theme for this morning. The Holy Spirit helps us just as it helped the church in Acts with tough issues. And we'll get to this in a moment, the Jerusalem Council, which was a very tough issue. And I talked about in the first sermon, I talked about change. Yes, we live in the midst of change and maybe now more than ever, but I'm not sure that we're experiencing any more change than what the early believers experienced. So first of all, they began as Jewish believers. They were almost all Jewish believers. And then you have the addition of Gentiles, non-Jewish people. And so you have to deal with all that. Meanwhile, you have a hostile government that doesn't really like what you're doing, didn't like you as a Jew, and doesn't like you as a Christian. And so I think we can relate. We can experience some of the same things that the church in Acts was experiencing. And we can begin to understand why they put so much trust in the Holy Spirit. I stand here this morning with 2,000 pages of a Bible. They didn't have that. So imagine if you didn't have the history of the church in order to continue to spread the church. They had no doubt but that the Holy Spirit was going to lead them and guide them. So we too believe that God is in charge of the church. And so in spite of all the things that happen around us, the church never dies. The church changes, but the Holy Spirit continues to work within the church. And so the words of Jesus are helpful as we begin this sermon this morning, John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now that was even before the establishment of the church. That was to his disciples, just reminding them that he was going to be present with them and they didn't need to worry. And then the verse that I used two weeks ago from 1 John. These are powerful words to us today, just as they were then. 1 John 4.1 Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And as we get into our text this morning, we will see a little bit more about that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for gathering us here this morning. We thank you for your church. It is your church. It is not our church. And so we trust that you will continue to create in us a faithful community throughout time and history. I ask now that you would bless this message. In your name we pray. Amen. Just as Lee mentioned, a lot of history had already happened. I, don't, I didn't check to see how long it was from the time of Pentecost until the Jerusalem Council, but it was months, if not years. There's something for you guys to check out, figure it out. And so what had happened is the church had begun to develop, and we had Acts 2.42, we had Peter's sermon, we had the church sharing things in common, we had the church taking care of its community, we had the church choosing another disciple, we had the first martyr, we had Paul's conversion. All this stuff's going on. And it's going on pretty rapidly. And there's a lot of stuff happening fast. And so we come to this point where there's been a disagreement. And so the leaders of the church have to decide what to do. Now I'm going to go all the way to verse 31. This is a story. So stories don't always need a lot of commentary. So as we read through this, I'll make brief comments. But this is probably the first major hurdle that the early church encountered. And let's see what they did. Starting at verse 1 of chapter 15. Certain individuals came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. If you want 
a bigger picture of this, go read the whole book of Galatians. That deals with this struggle that was going on in the early church between the Judaizers who said, you've got to be Jewish in order to be Christian. And that meant going through all the ritual. And so these folks were stirring up trouble in the church. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with several other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. In other words, we're out here in the boondocks. We're not quite sure what's going on back in Jerusalem. Let's see what they have to say back in Jerusalem. And so you stop and think about some other things that happened. There was a point at which Peter and Paul disagreed. And we have Peter's vision in Acts 10 that happened back there. And so we have a lot of stuff. And now Paul and Barnabas are going to bring something new back to the leaders in Jerusalem. The church sent them on their way. And as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. You can sum up what happened there in one word, testimony. Don't you just love testimony? You just love to hear somebody tell the story of how God is at work. That's exactly what Paul and Barnabas were doing. As they traveled through these various towns, they would share with the believers there to encourage them, say, this is what is going on. You're not alone in this. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Again, testimony. They're sharing the stories of what God is doing. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. It was a fight. It was a major disagreement. Because Paul and Barnabas were already out there leading people to the Lord, baptizing them and not requiring this of them. Now they get back to Jerusalem and they find out that there's this whole group of people saying, you've got to go back there and you've got to circumcise them and make sure they follow all the Jewish laws. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. I love this little phrase, after much discussion. I, I wonder what that looked like. Did it look like church council trying to figure out whether we can have people eat in the gym or not? After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. And there he's referring to the vision that he had in Acts 10, where he was told he can eat the, in, the unclean food that he was taught all his life that he wasn't allowed to eat. And so Peter is now taking the other side. He's saying, no, I don't think. This is right. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now you see the basis. The basis is they saw the work of the Holy Spirit in these new believers. They saw something happen, something change, and it wasn't related to keeping laws and being circumcised and doing all the Jewish ritual. It was simply God changing hearts. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Pretty powerful words, especially from Peter who was on the other side for a long time. For him to stand up and say, we're going to accept Gentiles or non-Jewish believers without making them go through all the ritual. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among them, among the Gentiles through them. Again, testimony. When they finished, James... Now, James was considered the head of the church in Jerusalem, so he'd have been second only to Peter in terms of the early church. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. 
the words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. And then James goes and he refers to the prophets. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. Here's the key. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. James continues, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them, now four things, abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Those were four major areas of morality in the Jewish faith. And then the key to this is verse 21. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Now, if you're like me, when you first read that, it's like, what does that mean? What that means is that these four things that James has laid out are common in the Jewish community. And if they see Gentile believers following these four things, there will be high respect for them and they will be much more ready to accept the gospel message. So there's compromise. James doesn't say we just throw it all out, but he takes some moral issues and he says, we expect these moral and ethical issues to be upheld by the Gentiles. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, who were leaders among the believers. So part of what they were doing was saying, we're not just sending Paul and Barnabas back because they might come back with the exact same story they left with. We're going to send eyewitnesses to this council back so that there's more testimony. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. And this is repeating what we expect. We have heard that some went out from us without authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. I refer to this as a love letter. It's the church in Jerusalem caring deeply about the church out there at Antioch and beyond and saying, we care about you, and so this is what we believe will help you in your witness and your testimony in the community. So they went off and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. And I love this line. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. That's God's faithful community is being created by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the application this morning, I'm going to just refer to, I think it's four short passages of ways that the Holy Spirit worked in the church or worked among individuals to help them know how to act and react and how to discern. A key word throughout the, the book of Acts is discernment. The church was trying to discern what the Holy Spirit was saying to them. And so the first passage is 1 Corinthians 12, 3 from the Good News Bible. I want you to know that no one who is led by God's Spirit can say a curse on Jesus. And no one can confess Jesus is Lord without being guided by the Holy Spirit. So there Paul gives us two measurements. If someone curses Jesus, that's an indication that they are not a believer. And if someone says Jesus is Lord, you can say, well, I'm going to take them at face value and trust that the Holy Spirit 
is leading them. Simple little guidelines or measurements for us to consider when we're relating to other people. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There's no law against such things as these. These are fruit of the Spirit. So as we see these in people's lives, as they're, as they're demonstrated in people's lives or in our own lives, we realize that the Holy Spirit is doing that work because we know ourselves well enough that we won't do them by ourselves. Then Ephesians 4 talks more generally about the church in general, verses 11 to 13. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. So they're identifying what the Holy Spirit is doing in the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Two key words in there, unity and mature. The Holy Spirit is the author of both of those. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19, the work of the church and the fruit of that work. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Now you might think, if you were paying attention, I missed something. There's at least one other thing that is absolutely essential in order for the Holy Spirit to be at work in the body of Christ to creating God's faithful community. And I'll give you several passages that refer to the necessity of prayer. I think we all know that without prayer, we don't really have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. So Mark 1.35 is Jesus' way of giving us an illustration. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now we know that he did this many times. It was a frequent thing. And this would have been following a day when maybe he had ministered all day long, healing people, preaching and teaching, maybe didn't get a good night's sleep, and then he gets up early to pray. It's a lesson for each one of us. Then Acts 10.9, this is Peter just before he received a vision, which I think there's a correlation. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. Just simple. It doesn't, it's not doesn't go into great detail and all kinds of flowery words about it. It's just pray. Be in God's presence. Experience a relationship with Him through conversation. Then Acts 16.25. This is Paul and Silas in prison. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Now, all of these have stories that are much bigger than what I read, but I think most of us know the stories. If not, go back and read them and remind yourselves what happened when prayer took place. Things changed. The desire of this four-part series is for us to recognize that we are God's community and we need to be faithful in the midst of that. And so we've talked about covenant the covenant God created with us, the covenant that we have with each other. And we talked about the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our personal lives, changing us. And then we talked about continuing that growth by the use of spiritual practices, making sure that we maintain our relationship with Christ. 
And then this morning, to trust the discerning process of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will move among us as we pray and as we wait on Him. It's important that we be open to the movement of the Holy Spirit, that we listen, that we interpret Scripture together, and that we open our minds and our hearts. So for me, one of my favorite passages is the one I'll leave with you, Romans 12, 1 to 2, which if the church, if we as individuals and the church follow this, we are God's faithful community. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for building your community. We thank you that your Holy Spirit helps us to be faithful. So we offer ourselves to you anew. And we pray, Lord, that in the midst of anything that we are experiencing, in anything that you bring into our lives, that we will come back to you and rely on your Spirit. Guide and direct us, lead us, to be your witnesses here in this place, on this hill, in this community. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
Good morning, this is Doug Kern. I just want to share a praise note um, for those who may not have heard. I don't know if many put it on Facebook, but Jacob was accepted to Kutztown and will go there next year to, uh, to major in music. And that was his first choice, so he's excited. He also got a, um, an academic scholarship, and so he's thrilled by that, as well as he was accepted into the National Honor Society. So we wow. are really just praising God for the turnaround in Jacob over the past couple of years. We had a couple, couple moments we weren't so sure how he was going to go, but we knew he had it in him, and we're just, uh, just so proud of him. Um, he also has an addition an audition um, with the music department at, at Kutztown coming up. I don't know exactly when, but uh, please, please pray for that. Uh, he's, uh, you know, he's got to get past that to get into the music department officially. But uh, we're just so proud of him. So wow. thank you. That's great news. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we come to you with thanksgiving. We rejoice with Edith and Floyd in improvements in health and we thank you, Father, for their presence in our community. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to um, to connect with each other and that you would be present in our community. Father, I ask that you be with the doctors, with the surgery. We thank you, Father. We know that you'll be with with Edith and with the doctors, and we thank you for this. Father, I we ask for guidance and wisdom in Steve's job search. Father, your word says that you direct our paths. You're with us. Father, and we ask that you direct Steve's path. Open doors, Father, that would help me to glorify your name. Father, we rejoice with Doug and Mindy and with Jacob. Father, I ask that you be with him during the audition. And I ask for a special blessing upon Jacob. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, um, life in the, in the church announcements. There's quilting on Wednesday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um and men's Bible study on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Also, I have an announcement. I checked the Bible in the pew, and I noticed that it has almost 900 pages, Um, which is kind of interesting because the two Bibles that I have have close to 2,000 pages, but I guess there's a difference in type. (laughs) But I figured I'd mention it because... I figured somebody would probably notice. (laughs) But there's a lot there. Uh, Does anybody else have any announcements?
Not seeing any hands, I invite the worship team to come up for the closing song. If you'd like to turn in your worship book, we're going to close this morning's service by singing Guide My Feet. We invite you to stand to sing. Let me start over. Peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your